Uh, could there be a complete explanation of everything? One of the great things about being a philosopher is that you can get paid to give talks with titles like that, right? No one, no one else can get away with that. Um, may, maybe theoretical physicists, after they've done all their important work, then they give talks like that when they're 50. Uh, but we do it for a living. Um, I'm going to read to you a, a short little quotation from William James, the famous psychologist and philosopher from around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, that sort of sets up the issue I want to talk about. So James writes, one need only shut oneself in a closet and begin to think of the fact of one's being there, of one's queer bodily shape in the darkness, of one's fantastic character in all, to have the wonder steal over the detail as much as over the general fact of being, and to see that it is only familiarity that blunts it, not only that anything should be, but that this very thing should be, is mysterious. Line of his from uh, uh, his work, Some Problems of Philosophy. Uh, James didn't, his reflections didn't take him in the direction that I'm going to go, but I think he evokes very well um, the kind of question that, that uh, it drives the reflections that I'll be engaging in tonight. Uh, so the, you might put the question this way, is contingent existence, and now, every now and then I'm going to probably let's slip um, uh, a little semi-technical philosophy term. I hope I do a good job of explaining them whenever I do that. But at any point in the talk, if you're feeling like, hey, that went by really quickly, I'm starting to lose it, right? Uh, just kind of do something like that. Get my attention, I'll pause, and I'll, I'll try to uh, explain what I, what I mean by that. So is contingent existence, that is, the very general fact that there exist things that might not have existed, right? Most of us, we think of ourselves as contingent beings. Had my parents never met, I would not have existed, right? There's an endless trail of, of contingencies in the past, any one of which had gone in a different direction, and it seems like they might have, then I would never have been here, right? So is contingent existence a proper target for explanation? Is it the kind of thing you, you, you ought to seek an explanation for? If so, what kind of constraints might there be on an acceptable explanation? There undeniably is a powerful impetus in all of us to ask the question, you know, usually while waving our hands all about, uh, why is there this, right? Why, why indeed is there anything at all? Yet a little reflection shows that a satisfactory answer to this question would require an altogether different kind of explanation than uh, altogether different kind from familiar sorts, from the sciences and, uh, and other forms of explanation. Would any sort manage to do? If so, would more than one? Uh, long dismissed by philosophers in the grip of various empiricist doctrines concerning meaning or explanation, these questions have begun to attract renewed attention in philosophy, and I hope in what follows to advance this recent discussion. Uh, I'm going to begin by reminding us, or informing some of us, uh, uh, why an explanation of existence itself is something that empirical science cannot possibly aspire to, despite the claims of some recent cosmologists, uh, themselves following Einstein. I will then highlight some key assumptions that underlie either the question of existence itself or attempts to provide a constructive response to it. I find these assumptions to be plausible, but here I will only be able to gesture at reasons one might have for accepting them. Uh, that any interesting metaphysical thesis will require contentious assumptions should go without saying. It's familiar at least to all of you who are philosophy students. But I, but I still, I think it's a plot. So I'm painting a picture that not everyone is going to accept, but I think it's a plausible picture and it leads in a certain direction to, to, to how to think about this question. My central argumentative burden uh, is to rebut what is perhaps the most common objection to the whole enterprise of seeking an explanation of contingent reality. Namely, that the enterprise is bankrupt since contingent reality, by definition as it were, precludes the possibility of complete explanation. I'll explain why some people think that's right. That if, if there are contingent facts, facts that might not have been the case, then the very idea that there could be complete explanation, no loose ties, right? Everything all tied up, nice and tidy, complete explanation, the thought is, is just in principle not available. So there's no good trying to seek one because you can't have it. 
Uh, I also respond to the typical fallback objection that the enterprise is animated by an implausibly strong form of rationalism, right? Which people say no one believes in anymore. Maybe in the 17th century, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, these folks went in for this kind of strong rationalist idea that you can explain everything, but you know, we've learned better than that. That's that sort of objection I'll also talk about. My goal then is to get the question of existence itself back on the table of serious philosophical discussion by showing how it falls naturally out of an attractive, if inevitably contentious, metaphysical orientation that I'll describe, making plausible that its resolution must be non-naturalistic. Uh, you know, na natural, naturalism, there's, there's no possibility of addressing this question in principle. I'll argue that. Uh, that is what I mean by naturalism, sorry. There's another one of those. You, you forget after a while which terms are our, our ordinary language and which are bits of philosophical jar jargon. Naturalism, you know, just being very roughly the idea that nature is all there is, the universe, the cosmos. There's no uh, reality that transcends the, the empirical world that we are part of and that science seeks to, to describe. Okay. Um, so I'm going to argue that the resolution of the, the question of existence must be non-naturalistic and argue that the choice between a thoroughgoing necessitarian picture, on which all is necessity, and one involving brutally unexplainable facts is a false one. We can have both contingency and complete explanation. Um, I, I argue this last point through reflection on uh, a broadly theistic metaphysics, metaphysics on which God is the, the source and found, foundation of everything. Uh, if my contention is correct, it's worth, worth considering whether uh, what other metaphysical schemes might likewise be consistent with complete explanation of contingency. I have argued elsewhere in, in the book um, that Jay referred to that a theistic form of such explanation is to be preferred to alternatives that at least I can presently envision. But I should be delighted if serious reflection on the question of contingent existence occasioned further development and more powerful defense of non-theistic theories of the, the fons et origo of existence, unshackled from empiricist handcuffs. Our own views are sharpened and ultimately better understood through engagement with developed alternatives. We learn more about how to think about God in relation to the world insofar as uh, people articulate non-theistic pictures and that pose challenges to some of the explanatory moves that we make. Right? You're sharpened through competition. So, so it's a, I, I often encourage my naturalistic colleagues to say, look, you've got to take this question seriously, and maybe there are some possible ways you might go about this. I even try to suggest them, right? I trot out in my book, here, maybe you can think about it this way if you didn't want to go a theistic direction. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get people to think about the question without um, presupposing what the, the answer is going to be, though uh, I, I tend to think it, it lies in a certain direction. All right, ultimate explanation is not to be found in empirical science. Um, uh, I, I gave a sort of a version of this talk at a big um, lecture, a big, a big conference uh, uh, on cosmology with a bunch of high-flying physicists and, and cosmologists. For them, this was the most contentious part of the talk, right? You know, we, can, we can explain it all, you know, we're physicists. And so that, I, I thought I'd leave this in here because it, it, uh, you off, one often hears in popular uh, discourse, you know, claims about theories of everything, even some of the grandiose terms physicists sometimes use when they're just informally talking about their ideas, make it sound as if they think they can have through empirical, scientific, rigorous empirical theories without getting into weird metaphysics, the kind of uh, explanation that I'm after. And, and what I want to say is no, in principle, you cannot. Empirical science just can't give that, that kind of explanation. All right, well, why think that? Ultimate explanation would be explanation that involves no brute givens, leaves no explanatory loose ends whatsoever, such that one could not intelligibly ask for anything more. All true, more limited explanations would rest on something that not only has no further explanation, but can have no further explanation. I will argue that no foundational physical theory could aspire to explanation of this sort. There's nothing wrong with physical theories, but it just can't give explanation of this sort. By considering in broad outline three main ways that one might try to pull it off, showing why these ways cannot succeed, and suggesting that the lesson generalizes. 
Consider first what I'll call the way of eternity. The attempt, this would be an, the attempt to provide an adequate theory on which physical reality had no beginning, whether of finite or infinite temporal measure. And I'm sure that phrase just went by some people. I'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, so it has no beginning. Every temporal stage of the universe, think of it as a kind of snapshot, the way things are right now, right? Okay? Every, every uh, uh, temporal stage, time slice, is fixed by what has gone before. It's, right, we're sitting the way we are right now because of things that, that happened just a few moments ago that led to this moment. And the totality of physical reality is just the sum of the stages. Right? This is the, the, the explanatory gambit that I'm calling the way of eternity. The way of eternity is instanced by a generalized Newtonian theory of infinite space and time, by the contemporary physicist John Wheeler's theory of oscillating universes, which is kind of a fun, fun idea. You know, we're familiar with the, the Big Bang, and you know, for a while, until the late 90s, physicists, physicists wondered whether maybe the universe would start contracting again, and we'd be headed towards the Big Crunch. They now think they have evidence to suggest that's probably not the case, but for, for a while they took that possibility seriously. So what we call the Big Bang was viewed from inhabitants you know, on the other side. That was the big crunch that they were afraid of, right? And you just have this kind of oscillating expansion, contraction. Uh, you know, and you can imagine that going on infinite cycles. That would be an instance, that kind of theory would be an instance of what I'm calling the way of eternity because there's no beginning and everything that happens at each juncture is explained by what's gone before or by any theory on which um, our universe is generated by some primordial universe generated, generator, itself eternal in nature, or maybe itself spawned by a sequence of structures that has no beginning, different kinds of structures at each stage. All right, so there's the way of eternity. Uh, second, there is the way of unification. Right? This, is, this is a different way of trying to answer the existence question. Here, this is the attempt successively to reduce physical theory's number of fundamental properties and property bearers, basic objects, you know, so like physics tries to boil down the number of basic kinds of particles, you've got electrons, quarks, gluons, and so forth, you know, and there's always this drive for a deeper theory that's simpler, simpler, fewer and fewer number of entities, fewer and fewer number of basic properties like mass, spin, charge, and so on. Um, and the laws governing their coevolution through space time, you want to, you, you, you want to kind of crunch those down too. This way's theoretical limit is a single, simple equation governing the distribution of some single, as yet unknown, fundamental entity. Realizing the physicist Steven Weinberg's dream, arch reductionist Steven Weinberg, uh, his dream of an equation that our descendants might display on their t-shirt. The theory of the universe, just a simple little equation, you know, kind of like E equals MC squared, which is not a theory of everything, right? But imagine a simple theory like that, and it, it captures the entire dynamics of, at the most fundamental level. With maximal unification, it suggests, comes maximal explicability, maximal, you know, in, intelligibility. You know, that, that's the best you could possibly hope for, the thought is, by way of explanation for why things are as they are. Finally, there's the way of plenitude which is perhaps a little less familiar to, to most of you. This would be the attempt to provide ultimate explanation, not by burrowing down or pushing back in time, infinitely in time, but by spreading out. Satisfyingly, ultimate explanation may be achieved, it is claimed, through the devising of an elegant and empirically adequate theory that locates our universe within a vast structure of totalities, other universes that exhibits completely non-arbitrary properties, right? So the idea is uh, you envision that our universe might be just one of this vast plenum of disconnected island universes. And, and uh, the thought is if we get a kind of non-arbitrary distribution of the types of universes, uh, we kind of like every, the, take it to the limit, every possibility realized there's something something pleasingly non-arbitrary. If there's just our universe, period, with all of its seemingly you know, idiosyncratic quirks, you know, the particular balance of ratio of particles and so on uh, that, that go on at a fundamental level, that seems kind of arbitrary. It might seem to cry out for an explanation. But if all possibilities are realized, the thought is, ah, there's something satisfying about that. It's just fullness, right? Um, uh, it could, so it could be a plenum of disjoint island universes or it could be 
a bunch of causally non-interacting n-dimensional spacetimes embedded within, within a single hyperspace of n plus 1 dimensions. Right. You, you maybe have heard of the idea of flatland, you know, two-dimensional inhabitants of a two-dimensional plane. And to inhabitants of flatland, right, uh, reality, they can only conceive the world in a certain way. But if flatland is embedded in our world, we could be looking down on flatland and talk about flatland in ways that they would find unintelligent because they can't look up, so to speak, through the third dimension, right? But, well, now, suppose you have a bunch of three-dimensional realities, like, and ours is one of them, within a four-dimensional hyperspace. You've got all these non-interacting three-dimensional uh, kind of hermetically sealed totalities and you've got this vast hyperspace. You could get lots and lots of what are in effect different distinct universes even though they all inhabit a single massive space-time. That would be another way to go with this plenum idea. Uh, this way's limit case involves the existence of all mathematically consistent totalities, all possible universes, including every hyperspace configuration as the MIT physicist and closet metaphysician Max Tegmark proposes. If you Google Scientific American and Max Tegmark and multiverse, you know, you can, he, he's got lots of popular presentations. He's very attracted to this idea. He's really a philosopher more than a physicist. He's got tenure now and he's really spending his time kind of spinning out these really elegant, he's got beautiful pictures, you know, to kind of give you an intuitive feel. Have fun with that. Um, so one might go further and combine eternity and unification. Though neither seems to quare with, so, so you might think you could, you could, have, uh, could try to satisfy both at the same time. Though neither seems to square with plenitude, as universes with a beginning or which are less than ideally unified would seem to be part of any robust plenitude. All right, suppose first that some version of the way of eternity were correct. All right, this is just the strategy that says it goes back, the physical reality goes back infinitely in time, back through, through the past. There's no beginning. Um, and there's explanation for why uh, the world is the way it is at any given one step by referencing the way it was at a previous step. And if you understand the laws that govern how matter evolves, there you've got explanation. So, so you don't try to explain everything in, all in one fell swoop. You, you explain it part by part. Every part gets an explanation in terms of what's gone before. But since the totality just is the sum of the stages, what's there left to be explained? Right? That's the thought. Um, David Hume uh, expressed this thought in his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion in, in the 18th century. Uh, Hume contends that a beginningless sequence of events may admit of a complete, purely internal, stepwise explanation. Um, even if each of its constituent objects is a contingent being such that it might not have existed. All that is needed is that each stage of the sequence has a causal explanation in terms of what preceded it. Uh, that there can be imminent stepwise um, explanations for particular events in terms of prior causes is hardly news, right? All of science presupposes that. The crucial claim here is that this form of explanation can be ultimate, leaving nothing further to be explained. And this claim, I argue, is plainly mistaken. An ultimate explanation would be unconditional. It would not appeal to factors that are themselves left unexplained. This require evidently is not met for local sequential explanations where one event is explained in terms of another which itself is an unexplained given in terms of the explanation at hand. This is not to say that there's anything wrong with conditional scientific explanations. Again, I'm merely pointing out that such explanations cannot aspire to what would be required for Hume's contention to go through. The point generalizes to other forms of scientific explanation familiar from contemporary theorizing. Explanations of the unfolding of cosmic history that point to the universe's earliest conditions plus its fundamental dynamical laws treat these latter facts as simply given. They're just basic. They might have been otherwise, but that's the way they are, and we explain other things in terms of those unexplained givens. Explanations cannot be unconditional if the terms are themselves all contingent, such that they, again, such that they might not have occurred. So Baylor philosopher uh, Alex Pruss gives the following nice example that illustrates the essential explanatory incompleteness of simply noting the stepwise dependence within a beginningless sequence of events. So he says, suppose a cannon is fired at time t0, okay? Very garden variety kind of event, and the cannonball lands at t1. All right, good. Here we are, time t0, there's time t1. Now, uh-oh, I'm going to get in trouble here. Boom. 
Okay. <laughs> My children, standardly, when they got to about the age of five, they surpassed me in terms of artistic skill. And it's just, all right. So here's the ball landing at time t1. Okay. All right. Um, where, where where am I? All right. Now consider the infinite sequence of momentary events spanning all times between the two events, excluding the initial time, t0, and including t1. There is no first event in this sequence, as there is no first uh, temporal instant, no first moment after time t0. Uh, time, we assume, okay, here's this a little kind of, you have no mathematics, you, you're not familiar with this, but you actually you are. You've heard of the real numbers, right? The counting numbers, so you're actually familiar with what I'm about to say. Time, we assume, physics assumes, is continuous, like the real numbers, rather than discrete, you know, with time, time atoms kind of jumping in a kind of jumpy fashion, right? Time is continuous. What's meant by that? Well, between any two real numbers, no matter how close you, you put those two numbers, if they're distinct, there's an infinite number of more real numbers. In fact, an uncountably infinite number, right? Because there are, there, are, there are bigger, infinity comes in sizes. There's not just infinity. But anyway, you don't, that, that's not, the point, all you need to know is no matter how close you get, there's always an infinite number of instants, right? So, so on a real, line, a real number line, right? Unlike with numbers, right? Between one and two, there are no counting numbers. Sorry, counting numbers, right? There are, there are no counting numbers, right? So there's a next number after one, two. With the real numbers, that's not true. Well, similarly, if time is measured by a real number and it's literally composed of instants, temporal instants, no matter how close you get to, um, so we're going backwards here towards T0, no matter how close you get there, as long as you don't hit T0, you're always going to have an infinite number of instants between T0 and it. Okay? So I'm saying consider the sequence of events that starts not, that it doesn't include T0, right? But it includes every instant, every other instant between T0 and T1. Okay? I probably shouldn't do this, but for those of you who know a little math, it's kind of like think of it as an open interval on one end, right? That is, you go all the way up to the limit, but don't include the limit point as one of the, the instants. And the funny thing is, you've got them all here, but there's no outer one. That's what's so weird and counterintuitive, right? There's no, you want to say, well, there's got to be a last one, right? Because this is a finite line segment. I mean, it only takes up so much space. How can there not be a, a last outer point? But there isn't, okay? Take it, take it on trust. That's the way it is, right? Infinity's weird. It took, you know, took millennia for, for people to kind of get clear about, about infinity. Uh, so, Though the entire sequence of events has a finite duration, meaning it doesn't go on endlessly, right? But it's still com composed of an infinite number of points. And it still meets Hume's envisioned scenario of a beginningless infinite sequence of events. Again, if we keep T0 out of this, this has no beginning, no first moment, right, going back. Each, and each is causally dependent, presumably, on events that preceded it. The reason why the cannonball's up here at this point is because of the momentum, right? They carried it to that point uh, in terms of what was going on immediately prior to that point. Hume should conclude, then, that this series is explanatorily complete. That is, again, where we, we, the cannon's firing is excluded. We're supposed to say this trajectory is internally explanatory complete. Why? Because, again, there's an infinite number, there's no first element going back, right? And each is explained in terms of what's going before, but it's obviously false. The entire sequence of events has at least a partial explanation in terms of an event external to the sequence, the firing of the cannon at T0, right? Now, one could object um, that in this, all right, well, I'm gonna just skip that objection. It's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice point, but, uh, but we, I gotta move along. So, all right, I'll skip that. Um, you, if you, you want to ask about it, they say, well, what about the case where um, it's not finite duration? Uh, does that change things? My, my claim is no, and we could talk about why if you want to. Um, now, the same, uh, there is reason then, uh, well, no. Here. We might hope to be able to conjoin eternity with the way of unification. But even supposing in the, in the eternal physical reality, 
that is maximally simple at the fundamental level in terms of its ontology, its dynamics, its topological structure, get this beautiful, elegant simplicity, right? Ultimate explanation would still elude our grasp. A cooperatively simple world would reduce the number of contingent facts needing independent explanation. But in the end, what we get is conditional in character. And in particular, the most fundamental fact of existence itself is left unexplained. The same basic problem confronts confronts the way of plenitude. There undeniably is an elegance, a lack of arbitrariness in the hypothesis that every consistent universe exists. It's a beautiful idea that readily appeals to the foundational theorist, whether physical or metaphysical. I'm, I'm a metaphysician, so I like beautiful, you know, elegant, simple ideas like that. But if it is a fact that all possible universes exist, and our reasons for embracing it are wholly empirical, if it's, if it's part of a scientific theory to posit this plenitude, then we must suppose that fact to be contingent, just the way things happen to be, among the ever so many less elegant alternatives. There might have been no such multiverse. That's the term that's used for this idea of many large numbers of independent universes existing. Or there might have been a less complete multiverse, certain gaps, just certain possibilities just aren't there or a single universe of any arbitrary type. That the plenitudinous multiverse exists at all will not then have an unconditional explanation. If we seek an ultimate explanation of existence, we must pass from physics to metaphysics. More specifically, and philosophers have pretty widely agreed, if there is to be ultimate explanation at all, we must suppose that there can be a kind of necessary existence. Existence having the same necessity as the truths of mathematics, right? We think of mathematical truths as necessary. They don't depend on the physical structure of the world. We bring mathematics as part of our toolkit to trying to understand the physical world. Why? Well, because we think mathematical truths are just timeless, necessary facts. Two plus two equals four, no matter what the world is like, no matter what world you inhabit, right? Uh, so the, it's the idea of facts that are invariant. No matter what the world is like, these facts hold true. So the idea of necessary existence would be the idea of a being that exists, come what may. Right? Other things might vary in terms of what exists in the world, but if there are necessary, uh, exi ex necessarily existing things, necessary beings, right, those things are part of any possibility. They show up everywhere. Okay? Uh, and whether this could be had by physical reality itself, as Spinoza hypothesized, the famous 17th century philosopher, or by some kind of maximally unified transcendent cause of physical reality, like God, right? Or other um, ideas we might speculate about. Necessary existence could have no direct role within empirical theory, though it is open to a scientist of a philosophical bent to suppose that it has application to physical reality, as Einstein, for example, following Spinoza, seems to have done. Einstein had this kind of idea that that, the, that the, the universe was this self-contained totality. Um, on a view that accepts the, the legitimacy of appealing to this feature, necessary existence is claimed to be a substantial distinctive property involving a superior way, to, way of being. It's, in be. it's a way of being of not being dependent on other things, right? Existing by dint of one's own nature. Just, ne right? Very nice, right? You have no worries if you're a necessary being. Um, the nature of other things whether instanced or not, will include the property being a contingent being. That is, existing contingently, if at all. And the difference between these two classes of things is intrinsic and fundamental. Uh, again, the one class will include natures that are self-existing, whereas those in the other class are ontologically and explanatorily incomplete in themselves. Existing, if at all, in dependence on other things, and ultimately on a necessary being. All right. Um, the remarks I just made concerning the distinction between contingent and necessary beings draws on the first of two assumptions, or you might say assumption clusters, that are needed to motivate the question of existence and develop constructive proposals in response to it. Much traditional criticism stemming from Hume of philosophical attempts at ultimate explanation rests on the belief that the notion of necessary existence is radically defective. The interdefinable notions of necessity and possibility, right? What's necessary is what, what's not possibly false, and what's possible is what's uh, 
not necessarily false, right? You can interdefine these two notions of modality, as we philosophers say. We, we, talk, we use the term modality. Maybe it'll slip into my talk later on, uh, just referring to notions of uh, necessity and possibility and things, essence-related notions. Um, these notions can only be given, the critics say, a thin or empty understanding. They concern, in Hume's words, mere relations of ideas or formal entailment between concepts. Um, right? So, you know, they, just one kind of example, you know, they'll say necessary, you know, we can talk about necessary truths, but they're kind of trivial, right? It's like, uh, all men are men, <laughs> right? That's a necessary truth, right? But it's trivial. It doesn't tell you anything about the world, right? Or all bachelors are unmarried males. That's definitionally true, right? You might say, right? This is the kind of, they're saying, so there can be necessary truths, or ta but they're all tautologies. They don't really say anything substantive. The idea that there's a necessary truth that says something substantive about reality, like God exists necessarily, that's illegitimate. You can't have necessary truths like that. All right, all, all truths beyond these, these necessary truths are just factual claims about the way the world happens to be, right? And they can't possibly um, say things about all possible reality. While the, the broad spirit of Hume's view has been very common in the empiricist tradition, which has had a very large shadow on philosophy ever since Hume, the, the many empiricist attempts to excise or deflate any lurking appeal to more than verbal or more than fo purely formal necessity in empirical explanations have failed, I think it's fair to say, and resoundingly enough as to suggest that the attempt is futile. Philosophical and empirical explanations alike often and legitimately depend on realities being characterizable by a rich structure of truths taken as necessary. We might call such truths opaque necessities, ones that we accept for explanatory reasons, not because they are transparent or self-evident in the way that logical theorems allegedly are. Uh, indeed, opaque necessities, I would maintain, are implicit in logic and mathematics themselves in the form of the essentialist commitments concerning propositional entities, which those truths are about. That probably went by a lot of people. Some of you, some of you might caught that. Don't worry about it. Uh, more readily uh, apparent is that there, there are opaque necessities that concern causation, natural kinds, you know, like biological kinds, uh, and basic normative claims concerning what constitutes objective evidence for what. Consider the vicious circle one would find oneself in. If one supposed that the canons of inductive logic, you know, the, the principles by which you're able to go from a sample, right, to making uh, a, a, a claim, at least a probability claim, about something unobserved, suppose those canons of, of logic, in, uh, inductive logic, were not necessary, but contingent, and so themselves stood in need of empirical support. How would you do it, right? Because you have to use inductive logic in order to support any empirical claim, right? You ha they, they have to be taken as necessary. It just, I mean, there have been sophisticated philosophical attempts to try to tell a story where, where that's not so. Um, I'll just assert, I can't give you the argument here, those attempts have all failed. It's, and, and in a way that, that is resounding, I think. That it's just, it's just a, evidently a hopeless enterprise. That the metaph metaphysician likewise appeals to this primitive feature of necessity in attempting to provide a form of explanation of the most general fact of existence itself, then, should not be ruled out of bounds, absent some compelling specific reason to think that necessity cannot characterize any existing entity. Um, all right, some remarks about causation. Um, I'm not, I don't want to read this here. I just want to say another assumption I make is that causation is not a reducible phenomenon. Some influential philosophers, again following Hume, who's a very influential figure in philosophy, have wanted to say we could try to analyze the idea of causation, the causal relationship when one thing makes another thing happen, uh, such that causation, in some sense, facts about causation really consist in a whole bunch of non-causal facts about just how things are laid out kind of in space and time and certain patterns that we observe. And there's no kind of fundamental relation of causation connecting one event to another. These are so-called reductionist views about causation, right? Uh, again, I, I think this, this is a program that people continue to pursue, um, but I think especially in, in the last 10, 15 years, a lot of people are coming around to uh, how, how implausible this program is, right? Causation, we need to, to um, 
to suppose is a basic kind of relation in the world. It's a basic explanatory relation. It's just this primitive, one thing's making another happen. We can say a lot about it. We can characterize that notion um, in various kinds of ways. But at its heart, it's a kind of primitive disposition, attending, right, of things have to, to unfold in certain kinds of ways. That's relevant to, well, it's kind of in the background of some things I say later. I won't sort of explicitly refer to it. So let me leave, that, leave it at that. I need to get moving along here. Okay, here's my final preliminary set of remarks. Right? It's, the, the preliminary remarks take up most of the paper, so don't panic. Okay? Um, <laughs> it's like, you know, there's a lot of kind of laying the groundwork and that sort of stuff. And then I want to look at a couple of arguments kind of quickly. Uh, we should distinguish between explanations, properly speaking, and ex what you might call explanation schemas, outlines, that specify a mere broad outline of the causally relevant features of some cause, some putative cause, and the way it works. But we should recognize at the same time that we could have reason to in endorse an explanation schema, a mere outline of a story, explanatory story, even in the absence of an explanation that fills in the missing details, if the schema seems to provide the only or the best form of answer as measured uh, by material adequacy and other standards of theory comparison. Note that Darwinian evolutionary theory is, in effect, a rich explanatory schema that entails, if it's correct, that there are possible true explanations of a certain type for ever so many specific facts about biological history, most of which are unavailable to us in any detail. Right? You can't go back. And we, we don't have an entire, complete you know, biological history of life on Earth. We could not possibly have that. Right? So it's a, it's a form of explanation that says every specific fact, most of which are unavailable to us, have a type of explanation. Right? Uh, so it's a, kind of a schematic, but, it can, but it's still a very powerful form of explanation. All right, consider the claim that the to totality that is the physical universe is metaphysically contingent, need not have been, while being a timeless causal product of a being that exists of absolute necessity. There's my explanation. Okay? This is not much of a possible explanation of the universe since it tells us nothing about the manner by which and the circumstances in which the necessary being gave rise to it. It just says, contingent reality, necessary being caused it, boom, end of story. It's extremely schematic, right? Now, we might give the claim a little more specificity. We might say the necessary being blindly and inevitably emanated the universe of necessity. It's a kind of blind, deterministic cause. In which case, the universe itself would turn out to be derivatively necessary. Uh, though not necessary from itself. It's necessary, you know, on this picture, necessary being necessarily gives rise to this contingent reality, right, which it turns out had to have existed because it's a necessary product of a necessarily acting being. Alternatively, we could suppose that the necessary being capable uh, uh, that generated the universe through an internal non-deterministic mechanism in a kind of chancy way, right, in kind of a probabilistic way, in the way that statistical sciences don't uh, they don't specify causes that guarantee outcomes. They just specify causes that give objective probabilities of certain outcomes coming about. So it's consistent with the cause existing that whatever actually followed it might not have happened, right? It might have been one of the other possible uh, outcomes. So there, there's, a, but we could suppose an impersonal causal universe generating kind of cause like that. Third, we might say instead that the necessary being is a personal agent whose actions are guided by purposes. It caused the universe in accordance with some goal or set of goals. This option subdivides into two possibilities. On the first, the totality of its goals and beliefs rendered it inevitable that it would give rise to a universe of just this sort, which perfectly reflects these goals. This is the kind of view Leibniz had, right? God is the perfect being, right? So he sees all the possibilities. He recognizes that a certain universe is the best of all possible universes according to some way of evaluating these things. And so God, being a perfect being, inevitably is going to choose the best. Right? That's one possibility. On the second, the reasons that motivated God to actually bring about this universe were resistible. It might have, the being might have chosen a different sort of universe, even holding fixed its actual goals and beliefs. This accords with the more traditional theistic view. Right? God, in fact, creates this world, but he needn't have done so. Could have created any of a number of other possibilities, or indeed could have created nothing at all. That's the more common theistic view. 
while all these explanatory schema are more, a little more informative than the initial bare bones thesis, they are still far from full explanations. And there are other similarly sketchy possibilities besides. We could, for example, try to follow Einstein and his hero Spinoza in thinking that appearances to the contrary. The universe itself is a self-contained, wholly necessary being, right? Down to the last, most contingent seeming fact that there is a water bottle on this lectern exactly on that spot at this moment in time, Spinoza would say is an absolutely necessary fact. It could not possibly have been otherwise. That seems kind of counterintuitive, but Spinoza will say the reason it seems to you like it might have been otherwise is that you're ignorant of the full range of causes that preceded it. If you, if you could see, you know, the, the, the marching forward of the universe, the ineluctable machinery of the universe unfolding, and the fact that the universe itself had to have existed, if you could, you could see it at its deepest nature, you, then it would be plain to you, right, that it was absolutely necessary that that little, little part of reality was as it was right then, right? But we can't see that, we're finite, and that's why we get the illusion of contingency, Spinoza would say, okay? Um, all right, so these are all, all these hypotheses are only schematic. Uh, but it's possible that you could have reason to embrace a particular one of them, even if precious few additional details are forthcoming, even if we're not capable really of, of generating further details. Uh, we could have such reason if one, one of them seemed to work on reflection, it seemed to do the, ex the ex explanatory job we're looking for, and not to generate insoluble puzzles of its own. And two, we had weighty reason to think that each of the alternatives we can envision either implode on examination, that would be the best case, or less decisively, they face grave uh, problems for which there are no clear remedies. And three, there's reason to think that the range of alternatives we had considered are exhaustive. Exhaustive, right? Imagine you were in that scenario, right? I give you these very sketchy scenarios. And imagine we just go through one by one and we say, no, wait, you know, on reflection, actually, this one won't work. Right? Spinoza's view cannot possibly be right. There's no way of consistently working out the idea that the universe itself is a necessary being. I actually try to give an argument to this effect in my book. It's the hardest part of the book. It's relentlessly metaphysical. I think I lose all my readers at that point. There's all the fun stuff comes in the last two chapters, but I've lost them all because we were burrowing down. I was, you know, wrestling in the mud with Spinoza in chapter four. But, uh, you know, suppose, suppose you were persuaded by that and so you say, okay, that's off the table. It can't be that the universe itself is a necessary being, so it must be some kind of transcendent being that causes the universe. Okay, it could be an uh, impersonal deterministic cause, an impersonal non-deterministic or probabilistic cause, or it could be an impersonal, uh, uh, sorry, a personal cause, right, that either causes of necessity or, or non-deterministically. You got the, all these scenarios, and suppose you kind of work through them and you see really deep reasons, even at that level of generality, for thinking, you can't get the job done, or it creates a really, really deep problem of another sort. Well, if by elimination you, you came down to just one seems to work, you don't see the problems with it, you could have reason to buy that schematic explanation, even though it's not really an explanation. It's never going to tell you all the details. Exactly how are we to understand the nature of this thing and how it works, right? Um, returning to the notion of modal structure, structure rooted in the feature of necessity, think of it, you might think of it this way. Explanations, especially the very general sort of explanations that are offered in philosophy, logic, mathematics, and fundamental physics, often posit possibility constraining structure of various kinds. For example, physics posits spatiotemporal structure. It says the universe has this space, space time has a certain kind of structure, it has certain properties, and that constrains what can happen within the universe, right? It's a kind of structure. Right? It's a kind of type of necessity of a, of a weaker sort than what I've been talking about. Uh, it also talks about the, the, the structure induced by the fundamental properties and relation of matter and of natural kinds. Right? So the fact that electrons and quarks and so on have certain specific kinds of properties and these properties interact in a certain way constrains how the universe can, can evolve forward from here. Right? It's a kind of structure that the universe has. Not just anything can happen tomorrow. It's got to be something consistent with the basic nature of, of the stuff that the engine that drives the universe. Um, the philosopher who tentatively endorses one of the existence explaining schema that I mentioned is positing an additional kind of structure to reality. A necessary ontic dependency of contingent physical things on a necessary being. 
like pure mathematical structure, but unlike spatiotemporal structure in physics, it's conceived to be structure that would obtain for any possible reality. Okay, laid a lot of preliminaries here. Everyone take a deep breath here. Uh, now, now, now we can get into the, the argument that I think you, you should be able to see what's going on. All right, here's the most common objection. I've been talking in very abstract terms about this kind of explanatory, wanting to explain contingent existence. Many philosophers object to the whole enterprise. They say, just don't do that. It's a dead end, blind alley. Just don't go barking down that tree, right? Why? Well, uh, you, can't, you cannot possibly give a satisfactory explanation, and their argument has the form of a dilemma, right? It goes like this. Either we implausibly embrace what you might call modal collapse, right? Where you th thought you had all these possibilities, and instead you suppose in the, fi in the final analysis all is necessity. There are no possibilities other than the ones that are actual. Every fact is a necessary fact. Either you go that way, right? All is necessity, which is a really implausible picture and has all kinds of problems associated with it. Or uh, we concede the existence of brute contingency somewhere or other. Uh, and we so have to give up on the possibility of complete or ultimate explanation. You, you got you, one or the other. You're stuck. If, if, you're gonna, if you're not going to say all is necessity, you are inevitably going to have some kind of brute that is unexplained and unexplainable contingent facts in your picture of the way the world is. Why think that? Well, they reason as follows. If there truly is a sufficient reason for every truth, a reason why that truth is so and not otherwise, then every truth will be a necessary truth because a direct consequence of the fully explicable and hence necessary activity or choice of a necessary being. So you're saying, look, if you've got a necessary being in reality, okay, well, its existence is necessary. That's what we mean by calling it a necessary being. And now, if there's some explanation of whatever it does like cause our universe, if that's really a complete explanation for in terms of some goals or purposes this being has, right, then then uh, it, but there must be an explanation why that being caused this universe and not some other universe. Well, that seems to mean that it's inevitable, after all, that it caused just this universe. There's some reason why it caused this universe rather than any other possibility. So now you're saying that, after all, our universe is necessary. But if you're going to do that, why not just go with Spinoza and say the universe is necessary and be done with it, right? Uh, or worse yet, you know, if the very idea that all facts are necessary, you begin to lose your grip on what the idea of necessity is. We understand necessity in contrast to possibility. There's something very weird about saying everything is necessary. Right? How is that different from just saying everything is just true? Right? And, and well, that, that's a quick, you know, you might puzzle about the very, you might think I'm beginning to lose the grip on the idea of necessity if there's no contrasting mere possibility um, involved. Okay? So we don't want to go that way. But if not, if there is at some point a merely contingent link between the necessary being and the contingent being, whatever that link is like, however the, it causes to bring it about, so that this contingent world might not have existed, even given the existence and nature of the necessary being, then we've after all conceded that some contingent truths are brute facts, lacking complete explanation. Right? Well, then there, there's going to be, you know, why, why did the, the necessary being cause this contingent reality rather than that one? If there's no sufficient explanation of that, there's a brute contingent fact. And if we're going to have some brute facts, right, totally without explanation, why not let existence itself be one such brute fact? Right? You, you, you lose the entire motivation for going beyond the, the, the physical universe if, if you are, are allowing some brute facts into your picture. This sort of objection is apt, I believe, when directed at philosophers such as Leibniz, who maintain the principle of sufficient reason, at least where that is strongly construed. However, it shares with defenders of that principle the false assumption that any complete explanation of some state of affairs is necessarily and fully contrastive in the following sense. Um, 
it, an explanation is contrastive if it explains explicitly or implicitly why that state of affairs obtains rather than any seemingly possible contrast whose occurrence is consistent with all the available mechanisms and the circumstances in which they operated. So wh why do I say that that assumption that all complete explanation uh, is contrastive is false? Well, consider that causal explanations can be targeted at a variety of things, right? You can causally explain a variety of things. Now, um, you, can, you can explain the existence of, of certain objects. You can explain certain events that occur in the world, right? So at bottom, there's the, the most minimal kind of explanation is just to give explanation for, uh, give information um, about the causes, the dispositions that gave rise to whatever you're trying to explain. That's a very minimal kind of explanation. Here's the outcome. Well, here's a cause. It has a disposition, a tendency towards bringing about things like that. Maybe it has a disposition towards bringing about other kinds of things too. But among other things, it has a disposition towards bringing about things like that. And it did. On this occasion, it did. That's a kind of minimum grade, you might say, causal explanation. Um, and uh, given that kind of explanation, um, uh, We get an explanation for every event that occurs, even if we can't explain, well, why did that event, that outcome happen, rather than some other possible outcome? Well, that's a kind of contrastive fact about. We're asking now a, a, a kind of fine-grained question about um, what, ha what occurred. Why did it occur rather than some other sort of thing, right? There might be no answer to that question if the cause is non-deterministic. But that doesn't mean that you haven't given an explanation for why, what, in fact, happened, happened. You did, in terms of the, the cause that had the potential to do it, that in fact acted. Um, look at my principle of contingent explanation one on the handout. The existence of every contingent basic individual and the occurrence of every concrete event in or among such individuals has a true minimum grade causal explanation. One that cites the activation of a dispositional tendency, possibly non-deterministic, in a distinct entity or entities. An example of an explanation conforming to that principle without being fully contrastive is the theistic explanation of the realm of contingently existing things as the causal product of a divine act of will or choice that is guided by some goal or reasons in the face of either competing reasons that being had um, to will a different outcome or the availability of attractive alternative ways of, of achieving the same outcome. All right? You, you can, it's, a, it's a common human uh, phenomena that sometimes we have a goal. There's more than one way to bring about that goal, right? We make a choice. There's no, our motivation didn't point, do it this way rather than that. We just had to make a choice, so we went this way. It's arbitrary just in the sense of it's, it's you know, it, it depends on our will, our arbitus, right? We, we, we judged, we, we just decided to go this way. We had to make, we had to go one way or the other. But there's no particular reason why do it that way rather than this way. Or you might have two very different things you want to accomplish. And you can't do both at the same time. So you choose. You have reasons for choosing. You don't just blindly uh, adopt the outcome um, without any motivation whatsoever. It's just that those reasons didn't give you a sufficient reason for taking that one rather than the other. Similarly, we can, we can think of God as a being that uh, could choose to create a contingent order like ours, even in the face of conflicting motivations that might have led God to create a different kind of reality altogether. But then the person says, ah, but now what happened has no explanation then. But that's not true, right? It has explanation in terms of the goals uh, that God would have that would favor this outcome and the capacity God has for bringing about that outcome. And note further that by understanding the, the purposive and free non-deterministic nature of the being on, on whom all possibilities depend on this picture, we can see too why these dependent beings exist only contingently. Once I, I realize we're dealing with a non-deterministic cause, I can see why uh, there's no explanation for why this rather than that. Non-deterministic causes preclude that type of explanation. But that doesn't mean that there's anything that exists that lacks explanation. It's just certain contrastive facts about what exists aren't explained. Okay. Now, put God, uh, you know, set aside thinking about God or human will, right? Even in fundamental physics, um, uh, uh, scientists posit 
kinds of causes that, that operate only probabilistically, not deterministically. Right? But they don't believe that at, at the quantum level, right? quantum mechanical level, the behavior of, of small particle systems. But physicists who believe that the, the world unfolds in a non-deterministic manner don't believe that what happens at the quantum level lacks explanation. Right? Of course there are explanations. There are mechanisms that are interacting and unfolding in a certain way. It's just that those mechanisms don't uniquely guarantee any one outcome. They, they just constrain a, a, you know, a space of possibilities, weighted w with certain probabilities, perhaps. And so they don't guarantee. They'll tell you it's so, you know, likely to 80% you know, order of likelihood, perhaps, that this outcome come about, but there's no guarantee. Sometimes that very same structural setup will give rise to a different kind of outcome. But there's, always, there's still an explanation for what happens in each case. I realize I'm reading much slower than I expected. So, um, so another way of putting this, jumping way ahead here, uh, the second principle I have on your handout, principle of contingent explanation two. Um, you could you could put the principle. So uh, what I'm after here is for some kind of non-arbitrary principle. What sort of? I said Leibniz endorsed a principle of sufficient reason. A very strong principle. It said every time you explain something, you explain why that thing happened rather than something else. If you haven't explained why that thing's happened rather than something else, then you haven't really explained it. That was life. Very strong principle. It leads to a, uh, a, a thoroughgoing necessitarian picture. Right? So it leads, it leads in a, a really bad direction. In a very implausible kind of picture. So the moral some people draw is don't look to explain everything. Right? What I'm saying is that was an unduly strong kind of principle, right? We can have explanation even where you don't have contrastive explanation. There can still be explanation for what exists. And so if we can't have it, we ought to pursue it. We ought to take seriously that there are such explanations. Uh, so I have the second explanatory principle, um, which you could think of is as you have it. For every contingent event or fact, either there is a true explanation of it, or there is a non-vacuous true explanation why that fact has no true explanation. Right? So this is a completely general principle. So I said, you know, that this universe existed rather than some other possibility might not have. That contrasted fact might have no explanation. But it's not just a brute unexplained fact. There's actually an explanation why that fact has no explanation. Right? Because contingent reality is the product of a non-deterministic cause, right, which precludes that kind of explanation, right? Another way to think about this. Um, you know, deterministic causes in science or in metaphysics would give you contrastive explanation. Where you have mechanisms that are probabilistic only, right, you don't, it's not as if you're getting a, a wholly different kind of explanation. You're still getting a causal explanation for what happens, right? But you're not being given um, a guarantee that a certain outcome would have come about under just those circumstances. And therefore, you're not, there's no possibility of a contrastive explanation. Right? But it's not as if sudden, suddenly, in a non-deterministic world, there are these brute, un, unexplained facts right, that crop up. Right? No. Because, and, and the reason it's not a brute, unexplained fact, because we understand why you can't have contrastive explanations of a certain kind. The, the causes that exist that structure reality don't permit that. They operate in a non-deterministic fashion. And a consequence of that is that you're not going to have certain kinds of contrastive explanations. Since they're, they're consistent with the possibility, more than one possibility, you're not going to get an explanation, well, why this rather than that on any given occasion. Okay? It, just, it just did it that way. On another occasion, it might be it just did it that way. That's the way it is. Now, this way and that way, those individual occurrences are explained. Right? But these certain contrastive facts about them are not explained. But we understand why. There's nothing brute and mysterious about it. In a way, you know, by contrast, were a contingent existence to lack explanation altogether, as contemporary philosophical naturalists suppose, um, there would not only be no explanation for this fact, the fact that, that, that this universe exists, but also no substantial explanation that enabled us to see why it has no explanation. It would be brute. Can you see the difference? Right? 
It, there's no explanation, yeah, but why does this universe lack a cause, given that it might have had one? You just, you, because you can't appeal. There's nothing further back there to appeal. You can't say, well, there was this nature involved, and this is the way it operates, and that's why you get that kind of outcome. Okay? All right. Cutting to the chase. Which existence question? You might, have, you might think this is really strange. Right? I've been talking for a long time. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to tell you which question we should have been asking all along. But there's a reason. Right? The reason is things I've said already now put you in a position to appreciate why certain ways of formulating the question of existence, the why questions, are bad ways of formulating a question. And they're to be distinguished from other ways. And people regularly run these different ways together. Okay? Now I think you're in a position to see why. Um, it's commonly put this way. Why is there anything at all? But this very general formulation admits importantly distinct ways of making it more precise. Here are some, here are some more precise ways. What explains the fact that there are contingent things, things that might not have been? What explains the fact that these contingent things exist? What explains the fact that these contingent things exist rather than those other apparently possible others? And why are there any contingent things rather than there being nothing contingent at all? Those are all distinct questions. They are not the same question. And the, there being a, an answer to one of them doesn't guarantee that there's an answer to all of the others. I suggest that the best way to formulate the question is this. It's not quite as pithy as why is there anything at all? But this is philosophically the best way to put the question, and I have it on your handout. Are there contingently existing objects? And if there are, why do those particular contingent objects there are exist and undergo the events they do? The reason to, pref to prefer this formulation is that it presumes the least about what is there to be explained and what form a true explanation may turn out to have. See, the problem with the principle of sufficient reason is it dictates the, the form of explanation that has to be given. Right? Uh, Spinoza and perhaps Einstein want to question the common assumption that there are any contingent truths at all. Right? That's why I have that first clause in there. Uh, and I think Spinoza should be looked at seriously. It should be addressed seriously. After all, it's the most economical way to go. You just suppose that the universe uh, is a necessary being and you don't have to posit anything further in your picture of reality. So if if you're just looking for explanatory arguments for a being like God, right, this looks simpler, right? So it should be addressed. I do address it, and I think there are problems with it. But, so I, I don't want to beg the question against Spinoza by presuming there are contingent facts. I want to argue that matter with him. And the second half uh, of my formulated question sets a kind of minimum bar for precluding brute, that is, wholly inexplicable contingent existences or occurrences in reality. Uh, some explanations that are consistent with my two principles of contingent explanation are not con consistent with the principle of sufficient reason, but are no worse for that. Contingency rooted in indeterministic causes need not be brute. All right. I was going to say a little bit something about J.L. Mackey. You got a couple of, uh, just, I'll just summarize in about three sentences, right? So some people say, Oh, this is so rationalistic. You know, you're looking for these metaphysical causes we don't have a direct empirical handle on. There's no discipline, you know, like you have in physics where you have controls and experimental results. This is kind of crazy, right? You know, why, why should we go in for this kind of style of explanation? Uh, first of all, distinguish two, two claims. And these are at the bottom of your handout. Distinguish the claim that existence has an explanation from the claim that human beings are capable of laying bare the full intelligibility or explicability of reality. That second claim would be ridiculously grandiose, right? To think that we are capable of, in full detail, seeing the, all the explanations. So if God exists and has created the, the universe for purposes, we can understand everything about what's going on there, right? Why God, you know, what is nature's like exactly, you know, in a full sense? Of course not, right? Uh, but it's not so grandiose to say there is in principle, an explanation for anything that exists. So that's the first thing I just want to say. Those are two different things. Second thing I want to say is anyone, a philosopher who denies that there is 
an explanation for contingent reality is actually committed to a very strong claim. In fact, it's equally strong. It's committed to a, a claim that is uh, implicitly a necessary truth. If you say that there is no necessary being, right, as philosophical naturalists do, then you're not just saying, oh, there doesn't have to be a necessary being, be it God or, or any other kind, uh, other way of thinking about it. Like, there don't happen to be unicorns, right? You can just say, ah, there are no unicorns, but there might have been, right? You can't do that when it comes to necessary being. The logic of the idea of necessary being doesn't allow you to do that. Why? Because the idea of a necessary being is the idea of a being that exists in any possible reality. Well, the, this world is one possible reality. It's actuality. It's the only possibility, right, we have direct uh, experience of, right? So if, if a necessary being doesn't inhabit the reality that actually exists, there can be no necessary being. Because a necessary being has to show up across all of possibility space. It has to fill out the map. That's what it means to be a necessary being. So if the necessary being doesn't exist in this world, it doesn't exist in any. There could be, you know, really powerful, interesting kind of beings maybe in other possible worlds. There couldn't be a necessary being that doesn't in fact exist, but might have. Right? It doesn't make sense. I don't know if you can fully digest that. Right? Uh, this is kind of what the modal ontological argument, if any of you have come across this in one of your classes, this is the lesson of the modal ontological mm -hmm. argument. The stakes are raised when you think in terms of a necessary being. It's either everywhere in possibility or it's nowhere. Okay? So, someone who says there is no necessary being is making a strong claim. Nowhere in possibility even is there a necessary being. The person who says there is explanation says, Everywhere in possibility, there is a necessary being. Which way should we go? Well, you know, here's one thing to be said in favor of the, the second alternative. It fits with our intuitive judgment, our intuitive hankering after explanation, right? That there, that there can be explanation, right? It looks like I, I've got to buy one of two very strong claims about the totality of possibility space. No necessary being out there, or it's everywhere, right? The one does some explanatory work. Right? If there is a necessary being, then it allows for the possibility of ultimate explanation of contingent reality. Right? Uh, so that's a reason to favor it. Um, well, that's all I'll say. Sorry I, I took as long as I did. Thanks. We've got a few minutes for questions. Let me encourage those of you who are thinking of bolting for the access to now. Oftentimes things become clearer in Q&A than during the original presentation because you can settle in on a particular issue that might unlock several pieces of the puzzle for you. And let me just say, no question is too simple. We'll entertain anything. So please, your questions. I know it takes a couple minutes, first of all, to figure out if you have a question, a couple more minutes to figure out how to formulate it, and a couple more minutes to work up the courage to ask it. So, we're patient up here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Speak up loudly, please, so everybody can hear. It seems that your account of, is this right, non-determinants of complex? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Can you repeat yeah. the question? Yeah. That so, so does, does this idea that I made quick reference to of, uh, I actually skipped over parts where I talked more about this in detail, the idea of non-deterministic causes, does that presuppose something like the will, undetermined will? No, I mean, I, I think we, we, in that context we often think about being free to choose, right? Being capable of choosing more than one alternative, not being determined. But uh, 20th century physics has taught us to take seriously the possibility at least that impersonal, non-purposive, non-choosing kinds of entities uh, could have non-deterministic causal uh, natures, right? That is, they, they, they cause outcomes, yet there's, there's um, given the totality of what happens, it's still possible that a variety of alternatives. So there's just a kind of a branching, reality is just a kind of branching structure. You know, here we are at time t, the, the system could go that way, could go this way, it could go that way. Maybe there are uh, probabilities weighted. Maybe this is 40% likely. This is 40%. This is 20%. All right, well then something happens. It goes to one of these nodes, right? 
let's say it goes here, right? Well, now, you know, now we get another interaction and there's more possibilities. And so, you know, from this point on, there's ever so many possibilities spreading, spawning out to the future. Eventually, something's going to happen. There's the thin red line that traces the way things actually go. But these were all possibilities. But they could involve choices, acts of will, or they could just involve non-deterministic causal propensities, propensities of a, of, a, of a certain measurable strength. That's my thought. Now, was there some kind of something behind that? No. OK. You just wanted to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to say this is not, I, I, I mean, it, it's not just in the context of thinking about the will, and people have a lot of disputes about that, that the idea of indeterminism only can you know, uh, you know, get a toehold. Uh, you can think of it in purely physical systems of an impersonal, non-purposive sort as well. In fact, quantum mechanics, as standardly interpreted, um, is just such a theory, and it's a very powerful theory. Right. Not within physics. I mean, so you could, right, so again, what would be the ideal? The physicist's dream is, I think, Steven Weinberg, he, he, his book, Dream of a Final Theory. He was an arch reductionist. He is. He's still alive. Nobel Prize winning physicist um, uh, and fierce critic of religious ideas. And uh, he, he, you know, his dream is that we could, we'll go deeper than the level where we're at now of electrons and quarks and so on. You know, there's speculation in terms of string theory and stuff, but none of that's confirmed. Well, suppose you get down to something like that, one fundamental kind of entity, right? And it's with simple little equation that governs the behavior of systems of these entities in interaction. It's a very elegant little, just describes a you know, couple of basic properties. That's as far, I mean, right? How could physics get more powerful than that? And, and for it to actually work, it actually, the, the, it empirically, you know, is testable and, and uh, is shown to be completely adequate. We don't, uh, and then it would seem like physics is done, right? I mean, how could you go any further? That's what, I, that's what Weinberg says. We'd be done. We'd close up the books. Physics is over. We, we now know the fundamental driving, uh, um, you know, force and, and entity that that, that that force governs in the universe. But, but there's still this question. But why is reality like that? Right? If it's contingent, it seems like there are, there are other ways reality might have been. Or why, might, why weren't there other universes as well if there is, in fact, only this one? There are still these further questions. And now you could follow Spinoza and then say, well, let's suppose that this universe, that this fundamental kind of string entity or whatever it might be, some kind of you know, wave-like entity maybe that permeates the entire space-time, uh, let's suppose that exists of necessity. Okay, but that's, my own point was only, that's not, you're no longer doing physics when you say that. You can suppose that, right? In your, when the physicist goes home, leaves her office, she could suppose that, right? But she's doing metaphysics now, because you can't test that idea. That's not something that's going to make a difference to any empirical predictions. And, and that's a candidate, and, and it should be taken seriously. My point is, science doesn't give you that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So when you're asking a contrastive question, you're presupposing there's a relationship between two things, right? Between two separate facts, right? And in this case, between the fact that this thing happened and this thing didn't, this negative fact. And you're, when you ask that question, you say, why this rather than that? You're, you're asking for a certain kind of explanation. You're looking for an explanation that links the two together, right? It's a certain kind of, it's a peculiar kind of why question, right? Um, but there might not be. I mean, first of all, not, we, we, we all recognize that certain kinds of contrastive questions would be bad. Why is it the case that I'm standing here and the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, right? Or, or sorry, well, uh, and the Eiffel Tower is not in Beijing. Okay, put it that way. Th these things have nothing to do with each other, right? So, so, so that would be, there'd, there'd be no interesting explanation of that sort. But we wouldn't say, aha, 
something deep is unexplained here, right? You know, there's no why this rather than that, because we'd say that's, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. That's not the kind of thing you ought to be trying to explain, okay? Um, so now, just to explain a fact uh, non-contrastively is just to give some information about what brought it about, all right? You're not asking about alternatives, you're just saying, tell me why this is here. Jay brought it there. Okay, that's an answer to that. But now if you say, you know, you might be wondering, why is it Jay always bringing the water, right? Why not him, right? You know, does he always have to bring the water to these the talks? Now you're asking, you're asking something different, right? Why him rather than some, something else? That, that's a different kind of question. Now, there might not be an interesting answer to that question. It might just be, uh, no, no reason. I just, Jay saw the water, he brought it. It had nothing to do. They didn't consult. No one told him to do it. You're the water boy, you know, not you. Uh, nothing like that, right? There might not be an explanation of that sort. But we do some, you know, but, but when, when it comes to two events that each could have happened in the same location, sometimes we want an explanation. Yeah, but why this rather than that? So when somebody makes a choice, right? Uh, I choose, I'm offered chocolate versus, or vanilla. Okay, well, take a more interesting game. All right, I'm told, you want to go to the ice cream shop or you want to go down to the beach and swim? Do one or the other. I can't do both. I've only got a couple of hours. Right? Let's say I choose to go to the beach. Okay? And you say, why? Why did you go to the beach? You're asking a non-contrastive, you're not contrasting it with anything else, just why this? And I say, ah, oh, it was a beautiful day. Just the thought of being out near the, you know, the, 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 the water and, and taking my shoes off and walking in the water just appealed to me. I thought, oh, that'll be fun. I haven't done it in a long time. Whatever I say to you. Okay, yeah, you say, yeah, but you were invited to go to the ice cream shop, right? Some people went down there. Why didn't you do that instead? There might not be a good explanation of that.